Oh, you're muted, Samantha. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, can you just let me know if that is working? Can you see that? I'm not able to see you, so. I can see it. Awesome. Um, well, thanks to those of you who uh, tuned in tonight. I'm really thankful to um, be able to speak to folks in the Raleigh area. Uh, Raleigh is where I live. I work as the Noose Riverkeeper with the nonprofit Sound Rivers. We are an organization that uh, our mission is to monitor and protect water quality in both the Noose and the Tar Pamlico watersheds. And so, like I said, I'm based in Raleigh most of the time. I work about a quarter of the time in our lower watershed. Um, and I'm just excited to share a bit about what we do tonight. Um, I hope to hit on some of the recreation opportunities in the new space and also the water quality issues and different ways that Sound Rivers works to address those issues and ways that y'all can get involved if you want to get involved. So I often get this question, what is the role of a river keeper? Um, I like to describe it as part investigator, part scientist, part educator, part lobbyist, and part ac advocate. Uh, we're basically a public spokesperson for the river. Um, and I also like to say that I work not only on behalf of the Noose River and the Noose Watershed, but on behalf of all of the folks who rely on that river and love that river. Um, so the communities who live in and around it. So North Carolina's watersheds uh, are um, myriad. There is a photo here that shows all the different watersheds that we have in the entire state. We um, are right now in the Noose watershed. And another common question I get asked is, what is a watershed? And so I want to pause for a minute here and just define what that is. The way I like to describe it is that any drop of water that falls within this shape, so this is our Noose River Basin. Anywhere in that shape, a drop of water falls, that water drop is going to end up in the Noose River. So via running off directly into the Noose or flowing into one of its tributaries, it's gonna make its way to the Noose and that's gonna make its way all the way um, downstream to the Pamlico Sound. So that's kind of a visualization. There's a lot of really special things that make the Noose River pretty unique. Um, just some general information for you all about the river and the watershed. The river itself is 250 miles long and it starts up at Falls Lake where the Eno and the Flat River connect. And it flows all the way down 250 miles from there to the Pamlico Sound. Now roughly two and a half million people live within this shape, within this Noose River Basin. And most of those folks on the upper Noose River Basin, which is that darker green color, um, but a lot of folks too in the, lower, in the lower basin as well. So this is a significant and important watershed. Some things that make the Noose really unique are that it's actually the longest river that is contained from beginning to end fully in the state of North Carolina. There is no longer river that's contained from the beginning the headwaters to the mouth that is longer than the noose. Uh, it's also the longest undammed river in the state. So the last dam, the Milburney Dam, once that was removed, actually in Raleigh, the noose became the longest free flowing river in the state, which is a wonderful honor. It also, when it gets down to the Newburn and Oriental area, becomes the widest mouth of any river in the country. At actually six miles wide across, it is pretty huge opening into the Pamlico Sound, which in its own right is actually the largest lagoonal estuary on the East Coast. It supports the second largest fishery behind Chesapeake Bay. So as you can see just from those basic uh, facts, the Noose is a really special place um, and really, really important to a lot of us. So I wanted to take a moment too to highlight some of the amazing recreation opportunities that are on the Noose River. Um, 
tons of lakes, especially in the upper watershed. I'm sure everyone is familiar with Falls Lake. Um, that is the lake that essentially births the Noose River, a really popular place for all kinds of recreation, fishing, boating, swimming. Um, we also have Lake Michi, Lake Wheeler, the Little River Reservoir, and many other lakes that are really popular for recreation along the entire path of the Noose River. We also have the Noose River Greenway, which is a phenomenal recreation opportunity. This greenway is 27 and a half miles long, and it starts in Raleigh, and it winds its way all the way to Clayton, and it connects on either end with the Mountains to Sea Trail. So on the upper end, it connects with the Mountains to Sea Trail around Falls Lake, and on the lower end, it actually connects with the Mountains to Sea Trail as it becomes the water trail, which is the Noose River itself. Other wonderful features of the Noose River. Uh, if you have not yet visited Cliffs of the Noose, it is an incredible place to visit. Um, these natural geological formations are our own little mini Grand Canyon here in the Noose watershed and feature a really impressive stratification of different kinds of rocks and minerals that um, tell a really awesome historical story of this basin. We also have down in the lower watershed in the Newburn area, the Croatan National Forest, which again, I highly recommend folks go and check out. There's tons of different um, trails and paddling opportunities. There's some really beautiful wetland areas um, and a lot to be seen out there. And along the entire path of the river, there's a lot to be seen. The Noose River uh, itself has Tons of different tributaries that folks uh, really love to enjoy. Some of people's fam favorite tributaries are Contentnia Creek, um, the Little River, Swift River, um, the Trent, Bachelor River, and I could go on. Maybe some of these are ringing a bell for folks, but folks really enjoy recreating throughout the watershed. Um, and I thankfully was lucky enough last year to have the opportunity to paddle about 150 miles of the Noose River from Smithfield down to New Bern and really see the way that the river changes um, and behaves across that entire journey. And every single stretch of it was absolutely worth the paddle and worth visiting. And it's very different, the faces of the river as it moves its course of around 250 miles from the headwaters to the sound. In Raleigh, it starts off with a lot of rocky shoals. It's faster moving. In some places, there's even what some might call white water. When you get down to Kinston, things get wider and slower, swampier. You start to see your cypress forests um, and the river slows down. And then as you get to New Bern, of course, the river really widens out and begins to have that estuary feel and it becomes populated with more of the salty aquatic species that you begin to see in an estuary. And then, of course, as you get to Oriental, it looks almost as if uh, you are in the ocean and you are at the Pamlico Sound. Some special species uh, that the Noose River is uh, lucky enough to play host to. This is one of my all time favorites, an endangered species called the Noose River water dog. This species was listed only in the past few years on the endangered species list and uh, is endemic to the Noose River, which means that it only lives um, in the Noose and Tar rivers. These are some other of the special, unique and threatened species that the Noose River is host to. The Carolina Mad Tom is a tiny little catfish. Um, the Tar River Spiny Mussel and the piping plover are some of the other species that are just really unique to this watershed and also a threatened species um, affiliated with the Endangered Species Act. Other fun critters on the noose, um, you know, the noose is full of life. And as I've said, the life and the population of aquatic species changes from the headwaters to the to the bay. Um, there's an excellent striper run. There's uh, tons of oceanic and freshwater species, um, and there's even alligators and dolphins um, at the mouth of the noose in the sound. So um, if all of that hasn't sold you on spending some time on the river, I'm not sure what could. Um, it is full of life and tons of adventure to be had. Now, I do need to unfortunately spend some time discussing also river issues. It is my job as a 
river keeper to monitor and protect the river. And a lot of that work looks like identifying the myriad issues that unfortunately plague water quality in our river and the entire watershed. So I wanna talk about some of those and I think that a lot of these will be familiar to folks who live in the upper watershed um, in the Raleigh and Lake Johnson area, or maybe things that you've heard of on the news um, or heard about happening in other rivers. So I'd love to talk about folks' experiences with these issues at the end. Um, and I will say that Sound Rivers, we operate as a hotline. And so we take calls from community members when they are concerned about pollution issues. So please, if you see any of these river issues that I'm about to share, we love getting calls from folks, Sound Rivers. Um, we have a uh, operable phone number. Um, we have offices in Raleigh and New Bern and in Little Washington in the Tar Basin. So um, as I discuss these things, please keep us in mind um, as you adventure on the river and come across issues or potential issues. So some of the things that I'd like to discuss are uh, the both the visible and the invisible aspects um, of potential river pollution. Things like litter, dirt, erosion, algae, bacteria, oh my, so many other potential issues. And then I also want to talk about what are the indicators of a healthy river. Um, on the flip side of the issues, what are some of the things that we might be looking for that would tell us that the river is doing well? So, Litter or the absence of litter, that's a really obvious, a very visible indicator of river health. For those of us who live in the Raleigh area, we're very familiar with the um, trash that accompanies urbanization. Folks oftentimes look at river litter and think, how does all of this litter end up in the river? Do people just throw it directly into our waterways? And I think it's important to remind folks that everything that washes everything that lands on our sidewalks and our streets with a big rain washes down our storm drains and ends up in our waterways and so it's not just the trash that's thrown directly into our rivers and streams it's really all of the trash that's in the entire watershed that noose river watershed shape that i shared at the very beginning is relevant here because any trash that lands on the ground in that watershed if it's on a surface where water is going to flow off, it's going to take that trash and take it right into the nearest tributary or directly into the noose. So a big thing that we focus on with Sound Rivers is cleaning up our rivers. And I'll talk a little bit about at the end about how we're doing that in, I think, creative and unique ways. Um, but I will say for now that, of course, everyone can recognize litter is a river health issue, especially in our urbanized watersheds where uh, there's more and more land that's being turned into impervious surfaces, meaning that instead of the water soaking back into the ground, it's flowing off into our waterways and taking all the trash with it. Another indicator of river health is vegetated buffers. This sounds kind of like a term, uh, you know, a, a termy um, use of words, but it's really simple. But it basically means is is there vegetation? Are there trees? Are there um, plants around a waterway? Now, in the Noose watershed, it is actually the law that there be a 50-foot buffer um, that is kept, that's vegetated, around all of the public waterways in the entire watershed. Now, of course, that rule isn't always followed, and sometimes the law is broken. And that can look like the encroachment into vegetated buffers. So who cares? Besides removing the trees from the side of the river, which in and of itself, some would argue, is harmful, you can think about what happens when you remove the root systems that are holding together the ground and keeping it from flowing off into the waterway. Well, when we remove our vegetated buffers, what we get is bank erosion. The noose, unfortunately, has a lot of this sort of bank erosion. If you've had the opportunity to paddle down the main stem of the river, or even if you've had an opportunity to visit some of the urbanized creeks like Crabtree Creek or Swift Creek, you'll see this sort of bank erosion. Now, this is from the removal of vegetation from the side of creeks that are holding that 
side of the creek, that bank side together. And it's also from too much development and creation of impervious surfaces, creating more runoff, more velocity of water flowing fast down those creeks and undercutting the banks. Again, another indicator of stream health or lack thereof. Another key indicator of stream health is water clarity. And on the flip side, sediment pollution is a major water quality issue. Sediment pollution is one that I find myself spending a lot of my time tracking, especially in parts of the watershed that are heavily developing. Of course, as you remove trees, especially on large areas of land, you run the risk of having that exposed dirt run off with a rain event. And so if appropriate sediment and erosion control measures are not used on large construction sites, or if they're not enforced, then we end up with this sort of sediment pollution that you're seeing in these photographs. These are all photos taken from an area that I spend a lot of my time working in Durham County, um, in Southeast Durham in a heavily developing part of the watershed um, called the Lick Creek subwatershed. And this is all sediment pollution. The photograph on the right hand side is one of uh, two sample bottles next to each other. Obviously the one on the left is quite polluted with dirt. And that was taken from a public waterway um, that runs adjacent to a construction site that has not been using strong sediment and erosion control measures. And the sample on the right is taken from a stream very close by that does not run adjacent to a construction site. So sediment pollution is a major issue, especially in our developing parts of our watershed. Here's just another photo to really hammer that home. Um, this is a photo of sediment pollution pouring off a development site and running into that waterway that I named earlier, Lick Creek. Another key indicator of river health, and this is one of my favorites, is biological integrity. So if you have a lot of the tiny small species that make up the very building blocks of life, essentially they're the food for all of the bigger species, then you have a more healthy ecosystem than if you're lacking in those species. And one of the things that we're able to do to determine if a creek is healthy is look for those little critters. These are benthic macroinvertebrates, if you like terms. They're tiny little uh, invertebrate species that you can see with your eyes, so hence the macro. And you can find them hiding underneath leaf litter and rocks in healthy creeks. And they're things like mayflies and caddisflies that are the food for fish that everyone loves uh, to eat um, and to see in our creeks. And so these are key indi indicators of healthy rivers and healthy creeks. And in places where biological integrity is suffering, we see fewer of these species and also less of a diversity of these species, which is a real problem. And this is especially uh, an impact that we see in places that are suffering from sediment pollution specifically. When sediment pollution chokes out the habitat that these critters like to hide in, then obviously they have nowhere left to live and they're less abundant in our creeks and streams. Another major issue that gets a lot of headlines is algal blooms. These can look quite visibly alarming, like the algal bloom on the left. Um, and what I have on the right is actually a photograph of, of microbacteria that can occur in certain kinds of harmful algal blooms that we sometimes track. And so algal blooms like these are a direct result of nutrient pollution. Algae love nitrogen and love phosphorus. And when we have too much of those nutrients in our creeks and streams, then algae blooms. Algae isn't always toxic. Sometimes it's not harmful, but sometimes it is. If folks can remember incidences where they've been told to stay away because of a harmful algal bloom, to keep their dogs away, that's because that algal bloom probably has cyanobacteria, harmful bacteria that can make people and pets sick. And so this is something we hear a lot about. If we see a waterway that has a ton of algae blooming on it, 
then we know that at the very least, there are too many nutrients probably in that water. And if you see what looks like a pea soup or a lime green color, that's a telltale sign of a harmful algal bloom. Um, and so that's one thing that we look for. And I will note that there are ways to report these things, not only to Sound Rivers, but to the Department of Environmental Quality, um, who actually monitor and run their own dashboard, where you can go and look um, at live reports of not only harmful algal blooms, but also of fish die-offs, as I have pictured here. So this is actually something that we have been seeing a lot of in the past week and a half in the lower Noose watershed. I am uh, actually sitting here in our Newburn office where I'll be working for the rest of this week um, because we have been dealing with a significant fish die-off event right now. This is another indicator of poor water quality and another problem that accompanies things like algal blooms. When the algae blooms, and then it dies, it consumes the oxygen that's inside of the water. And when there's no oxygen left inside of the water, it can create a massive fish die off. For the past week and a half to two weeks, we've been seeing significant fish die off in the lower noose around New Bern and Oriental. And that's a product of background nutrient pollution, like I just discussed, compounded by climate impacts like hotter, drier conditions. The last week of extremely warm, um, dry conditions, even though it, Idalia came through, we didn't get the recharge that we were hoping for, created this die-off event. And unfortunately, folks in the lower watershed are seeing that and feeling that. So this is another major issue. Um, thankfully, the Noose River has come a really long way in addressing its nutrient pollution issues, especially if you have a long view since the 90s when millions um, millions and millions of fish were dying off on a regular basis. Um, but since that time, there's been a lot of attention given to the noose and a lot more work has been done to address this. And still, we see events happen like those of the past week and a half, which tell us that there are still ongoing pollution issues that must urgently be addressed on the Noose River. This is a symptom um, of a pollution issue that we, with Sound Rivers, we hope to work with community to address. I promise I'm almost done with this slew of issues, but I wanted to cover the bad things before I circle back to what we're doing about these things. Bacteria is another obvious river pollution issue. Bacteria can come from a variety of different sources. It can come from animals, pets, like I have pictured here. It can come from uh, sewer line infrastructure or faulty sewer line infrastructure, what some call sanitary sewer overflows when those sewer lines backflow, like I have pictured here on the left-hand side. It can also come from stormwater runoff, like I was talking about before. When stormwater flows off of our impervious surfaces, it not only washes litter into our waterways, but it also water washes bacteria. Whatever is on the ground flows from there into our rivers and streams. And I think before I go to this, I don't have it pictured here, but another major source of bacteria that we deal with primarily in the lower watershed is factory farms. And so when we see um, confined animal feedlot operations that are nearby waterways, um, sometimes that can accompany spills and contamination issues, which we are often tracking through our role as river keepers. So here's where I can spin back to a bit of a happier note. Um, we are working hard to address all of these issues. Um, some of the ways that we do that as Sound Rivers are we do watershed monitoring both on foot um, throughout the watershed, not only on the main stem of the noose, but on its tributaries. We also take, we partner with a nonprofit um, pilot organization that works with us to get us in little planes and fly us over the watershed to put our eyes on places that just aren't possible to see on the ground. We also work really hard uh, to educate and partner with our community. We are always offering educational programs. We have a number of volunteer opportunities that are ongoing. 
And we love to just come in and do um, speaking gigs like this, where we connect with community in the places that we work and get to know a little bit more about the concerns and interests that the community that we work with have. And then of course, we advocate. We show up um, and engage with representatives at the local level, at the state level, and sometimes at the federal level as well. So specifically, some exciting projects that we have ongoing that everyone here is welcome to get involved with. How we deal with trash, um, I mentioned earlier that I think we're approaching the problem of litter in a somewhat unique way. We have been working uh, with river keepers across North Carolina to install these trash traps in little tributaries of our watersheds throughout the state. And these trash traps are passive litter collectors. They float in the water, as you can see, and as the water flows downstream and collects trash with it, these traps keep the trash and let the water and all of the critters flow through. We have officially installed these in our in Raleigh's Little Rock Creek, which is behind the Walnut Creek Wetland Center. If you are familiar with the Walnut Creek Wetland Center, um, it's a wonderful, um, wonderful public um, offering that the city of Raleigh has in the heart of a wetland natural area. Um, you can go visit our little our uh, little trash trap in Little Rock Creek there. We also have installed one of these in the city of Kinston and in the city of New Bern, as well as in the city of Washington. And we have more coming uh, in Greenville and hopefully in a lot of other locations. We're really excited about this. Um, and with the impact of these trash traps, we've been able to keep a lot of our urban waterways cleaner with less effort than doing the ongoing cleanups every single, uh, really you could do them every few days if you wanted to get every piece of trash. And through that partnership, uh, we've been able to build community. We actually got an award up on the top left-hand corner um, from the city of Raleigh. Thank you, city of Raleigh, for this environmental award for our trash trap in Little Rock Creek. Uh, we also partnered with the whole uh, a wonderful um, intersection of the city of Kinston, including Kinston's mayor um, and city council members um, who are all pictured on the top right and the bottom um, when we installed our trash trap there. So just, I think this just goes to show um, some of the amazing partnerships that are happening um, and how these trash traps are not just about removing trash, it's really about building community around this concept of litter-free rivers. Another key one of our programs is water sampling. Uh, we work with volunteers across both of our watersheds, the Noose and Tar Pamlico watersheds, to sample waterways, um, not just on the main stems of our rivers, but in tributaries that people love to swim in, that people love to recreate in, so that we can communicate with our community when the water levels are safe um, in terms of bacteria levels and when they are too high in terms of bacteria levels to be coming into skin-to-skin -skin contact with. This program is called our Swim Guide Program, and we actually have an amazing system where you can sign up for free and you will get your updates via text and via email. And during our summer months, we actually send them out on a weekly basis. So every single week, you can get a notification that shows you on the map where is safe to swim in terms of bacteria and where it's not safe to swim. And so right now through the rest of the year, we're going to be doing our sampling once a month. And as we get back to Memorial Day and summer month again next year, then we'll be going weekly, week by week. And so make sure that you subscribe and tune in to our swim guide. And if you wanna help uh, get involved in some of our work, plugging into our swim guide is an amazing way to do that. We would not be able to sample all of the different sites across our watersheds if we did not have a robust team of volunteers. And another key way that we take action as Sound Rivers is sometimes we get involved on the political and legal level. We recently filed a lawsuit against a major polluter in the city of Durham for ongoing sediment pollution in a construction site. And we also, like I said, we engage directly with our local elected officials, state elected officials, and sometimes federal elected officials to encourage and advocate for stronger protections for our waterways so that not only we can enjoy them, but everyone in the future can too. And because of our strong advocacy, this year, the Noose River was actually named River of the Year, 
which we are so very thankful for. Um, this means that the noose has come a very long way since the time of the 90s, as I was referencing earlier, when fish kills were sort of the face of the river. And now, while there's plenty of issues still to do, as I think that I've covered, there's still a lot of progress that has been made. And that progress is absolutely worth acknowledging, uh, especially as it has happened hand in hand with so many community members in this watershed. So I will wrap up my presentation um, by just sharing some of the ways that folks can plug in to our work. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do have um, offices in Raleigh and in New Bern and in Washington, and we have many volunteer opportunities in cleanups, in water sampling, um, and in other ways throughout those areas. So as I mentioned, we do need more folks always who can help us with water sampling efforts. Uh, we do always need folks who can help us with our cleanups, whether it's one of our trash trap cleanups or a beach cleanup or a riverside cleanup. Um, we also need folks who can help us document water quality issues. As I mentioned, we are a hotline, and so we rely heavily on people in the community to give us a call and let us know when there's something that we need to be aware of. We do um, work hand in hand with our regulatory agencies. So when you call an issue into us, we make sure that our responsible regulatory officials know about it. And oftentimes we will go out and do the sampling and field work that um, our agencies like the Department of Environmental Quality may not have um, the ability or um, the staffing or the time or resources to do at the moment. So we like to say that we're filling the gaps um, that are there and trying to support um, those efforts, and we really need folks in the community um, in order to do that. So please keep an eye out for the issues that I discussed. And if you see them, or even if you have questions and you're not sure, please do give us a call and loop us in. And just generally be an advocate. Um, each of you lives in a place where you have your own elected officials and you have your own decision makers. And it's very important that they hear from you that water quality is a priority. Um, there's a lot of decisions that happen all of the time that impact all of the different issues that I covered. And if those issues matter to you, make sure that the people who represent you know it. So with that, I will uh, close up the um, this part of my presentation and I'm happy to open it up for questions. Thank you all very much for the time and for tuning in. Thank you, Thank so, you much, so much, Samantha. Oh, maybe uh, <laughs> the share screen might need to go away. There we go. Awesome. Um, so yes, as uh, Samantha said, we now have time for a Q&A session. If you have questions, feel free to write them in the chat. Um, you can also unmute yourself or use the raise hand feature. Um, and as I see questions coming in the chat, I can read them out loud. Um, well, to give people time to think, I have a question. Um, I'm curious, with those trash traps, um, are they effective in more still bodies of water, like lakes too, or mostly just moving bodies That's like a river? Good question. Um, they really do rely on flow. We have a couple of them, like the one in uh, New Bern is on a pretty low flowing creek where sometimes if the winds are right, it even backflows. But then when we get a good rain, all of that water, all that rain pushes everything back through and it collects the trash. So mm -hmm. I think we would need a different device on a lake, um, but even a little bit of flow works pretty well. Okay, interesting. Just curious since we're at a lake, Johnson. <laughs> yeah. I would love to see something created for a lake. They've been very nifty, um, efficient devices for us. And we've been, since we've started, we've seen so much interest in other municipalities that it seems like we're going to put these things everywhere and that'll be great. Um, another question I had. Um, just curious about um, sort of prevention versus reversing um, different effects. So. But the trash pickup, that's a nice like litter cleanup. I'm wondering if there are ways to kind of reverse the algal, um, you know, like nutrition and sediment pollution, or is it more prevention at this point? 
We can definitely, through preventing more pollution from happening, reverse the impacts in the long term. So if we get a hold of the issue of nutrient pollution and runoff that comes from our landscapes, primarily the key contributors are agriculture um, and new development and pervious surfaces. And so if we, you know, were to get a hold on those pollution sources, then we would be able to, you know, plug the problem, stop the, you know, as they say, stop the bleeding. Um, and then in the long term, that would go a very long way toward improving water health. So yeah, there is no, um, you know, rewind button, but there is certainly a path forward that is hopeful. Oh, awesome. It's great to see people in the chat saying thank you. And also great to hear that there's a teacher who found this helpful. I used to teach as well and um, really appreciate when teachers are around and yeah. share this important stuff. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so not seeing any other questions. Maybe wrap up a little more. What's your favorite area um, or place along the News River Basin, just personally? Yes, I love that question. Um, this is a special place. I should, I didn't even bring this up in my like river tour that I shared. Um, there is a section of the Noose River, whoever, whoever's listening, you're about to get a gem of a piece of information. <laughs> uh, there's a section of the Noose from Smithfield down to Goldsboro. It's a 30 mile stretch or so, uh, colloquially called the Let Loans because back in the day they say it was so full of snakes and uh, moonshine stills that no one felt you should go there. Um, but it is beautiful. It's remote. It's largely undeveloped. There's huge stretches of it that are in conservation. Um, and there's no exits. So you camp on sandbar for a night and then uh, you get out the next day. But it is absolutely worth seeing. It's beautiful. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Definitely want to go. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, if anyone has any questions in the future, for all you who may be listening to this recording, uh, we love getting questions about what to do on the river or in the watershed, so feel free to get in touch. Awesome, yeah, well, um, thank you everyone for coming. Again, thank you, Samantha, so much for being here tonight and giving us some awesome information. Um, and with that, I will stop recording. Um,